morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Let's see who we got. I'm a little bit late in, so let's get started. Uh, let's go with um, a couple things today. And uh, how's it going with the hemp analysis? A little bit about Magdalena Obila's book. Um, a little bit about uh, who's coming up as our next guest speaker. Um, you guys okay with the guest speaker? You guys yeah. like that? Okay. Well, I can start with that one. Her name is Melissa Trujillo, but she won't be on until the 23rd of July. I know that's just the week, second to the last week, um, but 23rd. Uh, her name, yeah, she's from, what's going on over, Trevor? Okay, he's the eternal, I think he's, I think he's eternal thumbs up. <laughs> uh, she was in 2006 uh, a reporter for the Associated Press based in Denver. And um, she, uh, she has a story to tell in regards to Grenada, Colorado. You may have heard me talk about a little bit about it, uh, but uh, I won't divulge too much more about it and until then I want you to keep in mind though that particular year uh, 2006 because the events that occurred there kind of sets in relief I think it's a lovely term that we historians like to use sets in relief really what the conditions were for migrant workers at the time uh, through tragedy actually one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Um, I got, so I talked about that. Then we'll go ahead and get into a little bit. I, I think I might do another uh, writing workshop here, but it's going to be a little different. Uh, it's going to carry over to next week a little bit. Um, what was this? Okay. So, yeah, we'll get into the hemp analysis here in a bit. Uh, ask questions, feedback. Um, let's see, what was the other thing I was going to talk about? The um, Are we recording? Yes, we are recording. Okay. Um, yeah, what was this? Hemp analysis. Let's, uh, and the guest speaker and the VN. All right, who read this? Okay. Oh, I, I know. Okay, so yeah, Victoria has been on um, uh, doing her stuff, volunteering for the museum. Uh, okay, that is going to give you a really good breakdown on what may events that occurred in Colorado, migrant worker conditions, and the Chicano movement in the 1960s, uh, early 1970s. And of course, as he progress through uh, later in his life and with his activism. Okay. Um, any comments about it? It's a really enjoyable read. It is. He's kind of a somewhat humorous, but a very, uh, I guess, kind of a spiritual kind of guy. Oh, he told me that himself, actually. I don't know. Uh, he's a poet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was like, I don't know, it was enjoyable because it was an easy read and it was also like just the focus of the book, how it was on the Chicano movement was really nice. So like towards the end, um, I liked how it talked about Dolores uh, Huerta, I believe is how you pronounce her last name. Yeah. And rarely in a lot of the books that I have read do they mention um, those people. So I was glad that I highlighted. Why does them. Dolores Huerta stick out for you? Um, so originally when I took a, I took a women's studies class maybe two or three years ago and um, she was kind of in our textbook that we talked about um, but only briefly and 
the things that it did talk about I thought were interesting. So um, I don't know. She's I've a, always been interested in what what she's done as far as with was unionism. A mayor. How, how how did the uh, book your women's studies textbook not uh, dive too far into Dolores? Sport? She was a major player with uh, Shabbat, and she, she's still alive. California, right? Where are you? I think he just, I think he just disconnected completely. I think he's yeah. I think he's okay. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I um, I hope he gets back on. He, um, what else? Um, okay. I think that um, one of the things I have, um, I hope you guys got to the point of his bio, his little uh, kind of tongue in cheek bio where he kind of talks about himself in the think in the third person somewhat, right? Um, one of the things he will see is um, what was I going to say about I forgot what I was going to say. Anyways, um, what did he mean by the finding my wings? Did he, did he really talk about that? I think it might have been in a poem. Is there any one poem that stuck out? Just to us? Yeah, yeah. Well, to you guys, individually, yeah. I'm trying to find a specific poem right now, but the one where they talk about uh, uh, the girl who was a victim. Oh, here it is. Krista. She lived in the sun. That was a really good one. It talks about Krista, the university student who was uh, killed by a serial killer. And sort of just, she's sort of forgotten, but then it just talks about the effects it had on her family, but sort of the world just keeps on going. Yeah. Sort of, uh, and an I. Um, okay. Uh, Trevor just emailed me saying he's got internet connection issues. Uh, okay. Uh, let us go ahead. And uh, did he talk, who uh, saw where he worked or was active? Uh, and do you get a sense of where he went uh, through the last few decades? Um, you saw where he started, okay, and then where he started or as he continued. You, at least you got a sense of where he might have been in Colorado through the early, uh, late 60s and early 70s. In Colorado, <clears throat> um, uh, it's like uh, Los Alamos. Yeah, he just grew up there. That's uh, yeah, Arkansas Valley. Uh, then he he went to California or something like that. And then uh, what I think he doesn't tell you about, I think he was an LA. Right, he was in the LA area around 64, 65, when the, uh, yeah, when the uh, Watts rise kicked off. Um, I think that, can't recall the exact uh, ignition point on that, um, other than the civil rights movement, and can't recall specifically, um, or just being a, a poor poverty level area, Wash District at the time. But he remembers in being in the LA area and uh, he had told me the story about a uh, group of Japanese Americans who were young, who were in the National Guard there in California, LA District, and were called up in response to the, the riots. And it, it was a segregated unit that they have, Japanese Americans. And one of them was from Mache as a kid. And as you know, after World War II, a lot of them did go back home, I suppose. Uh, most like LA, some did anyways. Um, but he was called up, he remembers where um, they didn't do a darn thing. As soon as they were able to, when their leader left them, um, 
they went to the pool room and started playing pool and darts and stuff. And uh, he didn't point a gun. He, that was one of these things. He took a pacifist stance, uh, a lot of them, and did not point the guns towards African Americans who were uh, there protesting and rioting. Uh, I can't remember his name, but um, I think he's still alive. So, okay, so let me, um, And what was one thing in his life that may have had the, been the biggest impact on him uh, early on or in the middle there? What was the biggest impact on him? Uh, assassination of Martin Luther King uh, in uh, April 1968. At that time, he had... Um, um, Went, was at UC Boulder. Uh, I guess a lot of people like to say UC Boulder or something like that. Um, and he was a student. He started out, you see, how did he start out as a student? Was it um, kind of stable or kind of a hectic way of getting into college? Extremely hectic. <laughs> like borrow, borrow money from his siblings, a bunch of jobs. And one of the white students in the dorms took pity on him, um, rightly so, I imagine. And um, they found out and eventually kicked him out. But after Martin Luther King Jr. assassination, his classmates asked for him to speak. Uh, and started giving speeches there, and they pro started protesting. And uh, they're on campus. And there's pictures of that. I think within the uh, your uh, voices of protest oral histories off of uh, CSU Pueblo's mountainscholar.org, you can check it out. Um, he really started to become outspoken on that. It turned out to be a really good uh, orator in some aspects. Uh, and then, of course, a little bit of, uh, I guess, we, uh, theater, actually. Uh, spontaneous, I guess it was... Carol Teatro, uh, Mexican theater, street theater, I don't know how you call it. Uh, so, so I don't know how it started doing using theater and he was doing that. They were actually making make play or create plays, write plays, short little bits. And um, he wasn't the first one. He, he actually based it off somebody else. Uh, he, but they were using the short little plays with within the protests at on campus. And that kind of you probably learned a lot about that from California, uh, as you saw with um, George Ottavy going around. Um, he went to UC or California colleges to learn about Chicano studies, a lot about teaching and stuff. Um, part of that educational side, and then use uh, Magdaleno would really start to. Uh, be involved with migrant, migrant worker conditions. As you saw, he started out as Head Start teacher, right there in Grenada. And uh, what's gonna happen, guys, is uh, probably, uh, go ahead and talk about it now as starting from after class today. I'm gonna go ahead and start populating a folder in the Zotero about all, mostly the newspaper articles. And we'll talk about the uh, migrant housing that went on. So it's something that I want to use, make sure that we have a certain standard, not the class, the, uh, as far as comparing uh, migrant housing, okay? At the time, as you saw, the term was, in the most literal sense, was migrant or labor colonies, okay? That, in some respects, when I started out with this a year ago, I thought that was just kind of a, what another demeaning term used towards all. Uh, but it was literally, as you have seen, it was literally a colony, uh, to in a sense that they controlled them. Is similar to how uh, you know what other 
Western uh, empires may have done in a, in a sense with labor, an aspect of labor, but not, and, but beyond that, uh, as far as even uh, their lives and the concept of uh, uh, everything they may have done beyond to extend their sovereignty, really, um, that was probably what uh, the difference would be with colonialism. Colonialism, we usually see how the empires extended out beyond their, you know, normal geographic, political, ethnic borders of uh, power, like, like Spain, and then Britain later on. Uh, but let's not leave out uh, Japan. Japan's extension out, of course, you see how that may have uh, had a direct impact on Japanese here in the U.S. Um, that's, uh, that's, I think you already know what I'm talking about there. Um, but yeah, let this just, well, I wanted to make sure, I think we will go ahead and push that out on Zotero. So what's going to happen is guys, um, is I guess I best have gotten this out to Victoria. I don't think I did. We talked about this Tuesday as a change of, with just putting the hemp analysis and the last discussion response together uh, due July 16th. All right. Uh, and late, let that be uh, the percent that uh, be, what did I say about the percent uh, compared to the final? Do you remember what I said? Um, 22 point something, I can't remember. Yeah, I did I thing. put the final as that? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. And of course, we'll put the uh, hemp analysis still at 20%, but keep that uh, uh, addition, what was supposed to have been the uh, discussion response number four and put it to the final. So that's 22 and a half percent. And the hemp analysis 20%. So let's talk about, um, I hope you guys had enough. Um, so let me, before I go any further, as you see, I don't have anything really further. Uh, this Avena book finishes up the uh, pretty much the assigned readings, right? Um, and I think it was, where is, okay. Um, Don's not here. Let's go with uh, not doing any further reading as far as books. I think that's where I finished up at. Uh, if you haven't um, gotten to Paul Harvey's Amache, please do. Uh, at least within the parts that talk about agriculture, uh, at Amache, because around Amache they had uh, agricultural fields where they were uh, part of the camp, uh, but it was just the agricultural part. Okay, so next week is where I'm going to have you guys focused on the hemp analysis and then bring in uh, the, uh, what you would want to talk about. So let's talk about that real quick. So I don't know if I should bring up a slide or not. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep you guys up on the screen. So what if, uh, let's, let me go ahead and just throw this out generally. So where are you guys at? Uh, Cause I'm gonna see where you're at and then we'll like establish kind of an outline of where everybody's at. And so I can kind of guide you to what I may have said on Tuesday and then uh, some other stuff I wasn't able to get to on Tuesday. Um, did you guys see the website to go to to see who's registered for uh, currently on Department of Agriculture, the state of Colorado? Okay. Um, I guess I can pull that up. But anybody, anybody got any questions that are statements? Who, do, who, who doesn't know why we're doing a hemp analysis? Why, why, we, why are we doing that? Okay. Um, I'm not like, um, my question isn't why we're doing it. I'm still confused on the whole overall thing. I feel like when I sit down and actually watch the workshop, I'll have more of an understanding. I haven't been able to do that because my work's been a nightmare right now, but um, um, can you just kind of like briefly go over what we are supposed to be doing? 
Okay, so just, I'm gonna try to make it streamlined as much as I can. Um, and I should have probably been upfront about this. Well, <laughs> I wasn't whole. <laughs> I don't, I, I would, I want to answer your question, Justine, but uh, I need you guys' help. That, that's really what it is. This is, this is um, where I wasn't able to get to, but I was brave enough or stupid enough to go ahead and say, and I saw an issue. Uh, hemp analysis is where I need to see how, um, where the impact of the introduction of growing hemp by farmers out there, impact uh, the uh, challenges or new and old challenges with agriculture and migrant workers. Okay, so what's here's what is happening is, and I probably should need to explain this, is that. Uh, I can probably go ahead and bring the slide up. Uh, well, it's kind of two things, really. Um, one is, as you've already seen historically, uh, was the impact of sugar beets on migrant workers. Okay, you, we've heard of, Mag, uh, well, we read Magdaleno already uh, and see how the impact would have been at the time within actual uh, uh, social uh, action and social movement. Um, but what was the impact of the bringing in sugar beets to Arkansas Valley and, and Mexican, Mexican, Mexican nationals, Mexican Americans? Good or bad? Was it more good or bad? Or, or that kind of binary? Let's, what is the, what was the challenges? So we've talked already about what's going to finish up with uh, social needs, social support. So what impact was sugar beets and how did they approach them to, for how to work with those sugar beets? So you look at that historically, all right? So really want you to do is go with what we talked about with the uh, um, midterm, I believe, yeah, uh, is to see if where are we at now with social needs, social service support, uh, every aspect for living uh, uh, migrant workers. All right. Um, we're going to go in and look and see if, for example, right now, if we can, see who's registered farmers growing hemp and whether or not they've got migrant workers working and what their conditions are now. Okay. You're going to do as best as you can. And so it's important to get to the website, which I'll pull up the slide in a second, and uh, we'll at least find out which farmers are registered and growing industrial hemp, and then find out if they have a need for migrant workers and whether or not we can find them at all uh, at this time, and see what their conditions are um, compared to that um, 1960s, 1970s, and as you already seen as best as you can with historically at the turn of the 20th century. All right. And that's how you're going to gauge your whether or not it's just a statement of need and as far as get two words are final. All right. And so you have the next two or three weeks to figure that out. Um, so that's what I'm doing. We're, we're, we're bringing in what we know about the sugar beet industry, conditions of migrant workers going with the overall umbrella of human rights. And uh, my hypothesis is, and as you probably by now can kind of tell whether or not I'm kind of doing a statement of protest within possible violations of human rights. Okay, as you see, were there any violations of human rights in the 1920s when we saw Thomas Mahoney's little, uh, what, do you, what was it called? Mexican migrant commit, uh, migrant uh, committee, uh, but also with what, uh, what's his name, uh, Donato, Ruben Donato talked about. So it's very specific things, right? All right, we can start with just very first thing we can talk about housing. Okay, and very, very basic things go very concrete. So housing, how was housing at that time? How was housing in the 1960s after World War II? And now, 
All right, you will find that uh, um, by the time I get to next week, uh, very com uh, you'll see that significance, uh, I believe, within Grenada and the housing standards. Okay, so there's housing standards that should be met. Um, and then second, what's the, what could be this another thing? We've talked about this already. What was in Lenny Avila doing? And for what reason? What is Head Start? Childhood education, early childhood education, education. All right, children. What's another thing as far as in the environmental? What's the one thing? Water. Huh? Water. Okay. Water. What kind of water? What clean water. Okay. How was they? How are they getting water in the colonia? A lot in the colonias. Very important because that's a big difference between then and now. I mean, today I go out. Where were they getting their water from? When they were living in the adobe buildings, where were they getting their water from? A centralized area outside a, a cistern. Okay. No indoor plumbing. Where was that water coming from, from the cistern? Okay, we talked about Salt Creek area down here in Pueblo. Where were they getting their water from? It's like a, a creek slash lake-ish thing, but they're dumping slag in there, so it was poisoning them. Okay, yeah. Okay, so as far as water and how are they doing their laundry? Was there a place to do laundry, wash their clothes, basic living conditions? No, they were grabbing that water from the cistern. All right. Probably, and they didn't, how often do you, how long, how, as far as personal hygiene connected to their own health? How were the kids, how were they take clean themselves? They probably hang it the, once a week and grab that water and heat it up. Um, for the kids outside. Okay, for example, um, let's see what else. Oh, okay, so we've already talked about how they were learning. Okay, was what was the state condition of education at the time? Compulsory public school as compared to the other folks in town. Rather discriminatory, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, where, in, um, Where were these colonials located at? One of the things I'll be touching upon next week. Gosh, I hope so. Let's see. Where were these labor colonies located at comparatively with the town or the sugar beet factory or the fields? So on, the, on the edge of town and mostly on the, on the sugar beet uh, plantations, if I can use that word. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wow, you bring up a really good point. I don't know. No, um, anybody want to chime in? No. Wow, that's a really good state. I oh my, oh we could spend all day on that. Uh, no, I don't. They didn't call them plantations. They were, um, because that's that brings in a different aspect of what the labor would be. Of course, we can all. Mm -hmm. um, no, it, it was just the. Um, Farmers' land, but it well central land, but it was other uh, lands that other farmers were on, and then sugar beet factory was in cahoots. So it was really the sugar beet company that shot out the, their houses, material and stuff, and then the company store, and then kind of similar with an aspect of industry, and like Ludlow and the coal mine, uh, C F and I and Rockefeller. Okay. Um, no, that's a really good point. I think it's, but I don't want you to get too far on that. We, one of the things that, um, yeah. Um, so what else? So we talked about education, water, the housing. It's okay, about houses themselves. Okay, so were the, there was there segregation as far as physically uh, the areas where they lived. And willful was it segregated? Yes. Yeah. The other side of the irrigation ditch, other side of the railroad tracks, in literal terms. Um, what else? Water connection. 
Um, where were they getting their water from? We saw that in Salt Creek where the, they didn't want to tie in that. And, but the other subdivision uh, was being put in that was more focused towards, uh, you know, the uh, Anglo uh, citizens. Okay. All right. Uh, and man, what else? What are, what are other areas we're talking about? Talked about um, what about healthcare? What was the condition of healthcare? Non-existent. Non-existent. Okay, 1967, late 1960s, early 70s. What did what did Magna Leno Vila talk about as far as the startup of clinics uh, and how to fund them or the need for them? Uh, compared to the 1920s and uh, well at the turn of the 20th century. Non-existent at that time and then eventually by uh, well where would have been uh, we can't really scratch out where would have been uh, anything to help maybe with were they coming out from the fields just still you know what children what was how how did it affect children uh, working 10 to 12 hours a day. Child labor. Okay, there's one aspect. Child labor. All right, and that ties into their ability for early childhood education. Let's talk about women. How did this affect women? What was the conditions of Chicano women, Mexican Americans, and those who, you know, pregnant? Okay, we'll get back into health care, but what about daycare? What about, okay, uh, what else? Transportation. Mm -hmm. A lot of the concern, oh, there was a lot of accidents and uh, between their, or getting to areas from either transportation, how did, what was the state of transportation at the time of the sugar beet industry? Just the specific individuals that were allowed to use transportation? Uh, not in a social sense, more in a safety sense, literally. So there were a lot of oh. accidents between the, the, on the way up from either the, the Texas borderlands or whatever area they were like, like the Pacific Northwest or California. As you see perhaps though with, uh, during the Great Depression and uh, Dust Bowl, there was a lot of migration on both sides of the house. The Okies from, the Okies, okay. Uh, but also later on, even by, after World War II, a lot of car accidents, truck accidents. Uh, one, so there was, you know, transportation in between. Um, and here when you come across the 23rd of Mesa Trujillo coming through, uh, and she'll talk in, uh, within that aspect. Okay. I want you guys to kind of sort of look at, well, how we live right now or how each of you individually learn or live in your quality of life or what very tangible aspects in daily life uh, are you having to help yourself with that quality of life or standard of living? So, and look at, I need you guys to frame it within aspects of human rights. All right, um, so we're gonna go there. That's not me going there, it was Magdaleno Rosavilla. And surprisingly with March Tanawaki, Japanese American survivors after World War II, and human rights. Uh, if you read Amache, you know what I'm talking about uh, within human rights as far as unlawful, immoral, unethical, uh, unconstitutional, um, not, no due, to due process as far as relocating by force a group of American citizens to another area. Okay, for Mexican Americans, it was. Um, this is, yeah, this was for what exactly? What was their human rights violation, their standard of living and their quality of life? All right, you can frame it into like, oh, well, um, you know, we got ourselves a pot of water. 
Okay. What is the aspect of environmental justice? We haven't really talked about that too much, that term itself. So let me just go over here to environmental racism. What is environmental racism? What's the concern? Human rights, as you saw in Salt Creek. Okay. Question, I'm still wondering and I'm concerned about, and I'll be skeptical, I'm looking at this skeptically, is even though they did oral histories, did it affect? their local policies in regards to making sure it doesn't happen again. They want to bring in economic development and commercial entities uh, and industry. How do you make sure that that doesn't happen again? You know, if we turn our backs, you know, we already have stuff on the books, both from the local, municipal, county, state, national, that we don't have to worry about these these developers, these land developers, if the corporations, agribusinesses will do the right thing and be uh, responsible environmental stewards. Within the aspect of the environment is not just uh, a call it ecological part, it's not the nature environment, it is also those who work and the marginalized groups that continue to be uh, discriminated against within the environment, all right? That's what I'm trying to get at with the hemp analysis. That was a very long answer, Justine. So what you're looking for is very basic stuff. I need your help because I haven't been able to get to it. The whole time was looking for the last year on newspaper articles in regards to conditions of migrants uh, since the time we started with the, uh, well, you saw within the mid part of the 19th century and all the way up to now. All right, hemp analysis and hemp is very, very recent development. 2012, Colorado legalized marijuana for recreational medicinal, medicinal use. And it's really only recently, like last November, that finally the federal government and Trump decided that to bring in and let the US Department of Agriculture recognize hemp as part of agriculture and other crops and regards to federal subsidies. State of Colorado started in with their own no policies incentives back in before that, but it wasn't recognized as a piece of official agriculture nationally. So that means that the US Department of Agriculture was not needing to track what was being grown agriculturally like hemp nor second part what's the second part i'm going to get to you guys know where i'm going what, what's the second part what's the second agency what is the second part here agriculture labor thank you <laughs> second part okay though they, they legalized the marijuana and then grow start growing hemp there's uh, incentives on the state level to start growing hemp uh, for farmers and agribusiness, so you have their CBD oil, or um, uh, the, I want to just talk about the industrial hemp part, the stuff that's below 0.3 THC, okay? The second part was it, the Department of Labor, United States, again, wasn't tracking what they were supposed to be tracking with the regular parts of agriculture, and that's regards to registered contract workers that are leased or work to hire migrant workers or seasonal workers. Okay, they weren't doing that until finally last November when agreement between the US Department of Agriculture and the Department of Labor and the state of Colorado decided, okay, it's a piece of agriculture. Now we can keep tracking. So yes, so Department of Labor needs to farmers and agri farmers and contract workers who hire the migrant workers must be registered. Three months ago, I put in a Freedom of Information Act request for last past uh, registrations. I've yet to get them. Second, second thing is this, and this I hope brings into context what, and I'll go ahead and bring up the slide. I can.
So, get you guys back over here. Still recording, I hope. Okay, so really, it's here's big. Whenever something you talk to somebody, like you know, within a purpose, you talk to somebody for a purpose, and you're like an historian or scholar, you're trying to find out information. And sometimes that information, when you look at it within a historical, you have sort of so, set of questions you'd like to find out about a certain an event period of time. So I talked to Kelly Roach from the Lamar, Colorado. You guys can see this? Yes. Okay, let me get rid of this stupid thing. Okay. I talked to Kelly Roach. He's an agronomist at the Southeast Area um, Agent, Colorado State Ex University Extension Office in Lamar. Uh, this was last fall, October and November. Um, Talked him over the phone. Now, what is an ex what is an extension office? You guys read Legacies of Dust. What is an extension office? Do I need to go get the book? <laughs> My book is upstairs. Talked about the okay. No, wait a minute. All right, hold on. What are extension offices? What is something that? How did Swink? How do they come up with idea of sugar beets? What's up in Fort? What was Fort? What was up in Fort Collins, or what was set up out there in the middle of nowhere to think about and start looking into growing sugar beets, or even alfalfa? What was that Fort Collins? What was CSU before it was CSU? I don't remember the title. <laughs> what? <laughs> I said they remember its title, but it's an it's a a land grant college. So they part of their thing is they have to they study agriculture. So it was Colorado Agricultural Agricultural College. Yes, still is. All right. Um, but what did they had experiment stations out in the middle of nowhere, other places, right? Uh, that they set up to test and just really literally see how seeds are going and got these seeds from Europe or Germany, sugar beet seeds, and they planted them to see how they would grow. And what is the challenges when you, within this area, as far as growing anything, Arkansas Valley or overall the High Plains, what? What's the Water. word? Yeah, what do you, what's the term for the land? About limited amount of water. Arid, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I know you guys are on board with, uh, it's just, uh, um, it, it, it's been a few weeks. And I know that I can see already from the last couple of weeks, you guys were in week, what week are we? Week nine, okay. Yeah, so we got three more weeks left. I want you guys to hopefully try to I'm trying to figure out a way to reinvigorate everyone to the to get the hangout and understand where we're going with this. Okay, so yeah, um, that's when the extension office was after the Dust Bowl and FDR stuff. Well, even before that, excuse me, the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression really started after um, about the time that Theodore Roosevelt was around, right? These, these, these extension offices that are still running. It was in response at the time to the farmers and then, of course, the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression. Um, and, of course, the biggest thing is, and that's mostly about in response to trying to grow anything here in the American West, which mostly is arid land and not very much rainfall. Okay. Um, so he's an agronomist. What's an agronomist? It's not, he's not an agriculturalist. He's more specific to the uh, specifics of growing seeds and plants and water and uh, conditions of the soil. Okay, so he told me last uh, fall, he saw some folks out near McClave, Benton County, uh, working out and weeding in the hemp field. And he told them near McClave, uh, around Benton County. Uh, that 
was July, August. He said about 40 or 50 of them. And they were weeding like they were doing with the hose. I think, yeah, with the hose weeding. And what similar in, within sugar beets when you had to, what, uh, with the hole, to weed them. Why did they need to weed? Why did they need to cut the weeds away? There's more room for the plant. Okay, so yeah, so for the sugar beet itself that's in the ground to grow big and big, and but then of course uh, uh, more sugar within it uh, content. Um, so he told me yeah, he saw them out there. I think it was late July or so, a week or two, because he worked. He worked in the. He lived in the area. And he went. He works in Lamar. To me, it's back and forth. And so okay. And he didn't know who it was specifically. Uh, one of his coworkers somewhere else in, in another extension office corroborated this. And so ever since then, I've tried to see, well, he told me who works, uh, is agri, what's agri, yeah, it's an agribusiness. Name is Nature's Best. And they were growing for organically, they said, no pesticides or herbicides. And no, well, I don't know about fertilizer. No, uh, ag, yeah, agribusiness, Nature's Best. I tried to find who they were. I tried to find who the land owned to. There was a farmer. So I think it was Grasmic Farms. But I cannot find where these, who these people were, nor were where, where they lived at the time. Now, there were a bunch of vehicles around at the time uh, that were parked. So whether or not they were seasonal migrant workers or just, you know, um, seasonal workers where they just worked and they went home that day i don't know so i can't find out i've already asked so i kind of gives you an idea all right um where we're at and where we need to find some information and whether like this is the time of year where they should be out there so I, well what's their conditions right now and what is the governments and local organizations doing i can tell you that the uh organizations that I told you about like yesterday in regards to what did I call them? Yeah, the um, State Monitor Advocate. Okay, State Monitor Advocate. Um, yeah, she's a Colorado Department of Agriculture. So here's the website. This is the link, it goes to a Google Drive. I got somebody coming in. So here, let me, okay, you guys see that? You saw the link? All right, by county, here's, let me go to head and go to Prowers and you go, bam. Now let's go to Bent County, I think. I don't know if I can, okay, Bent. Go to Bent County. So this is the plant of Colorado Active Industrial Hemp Registrations by County. I just need you guys to what I said on Tuesday to find as close as you can uh, who is registered, who's growing hemp this season. This was generated just a couple days ago. This is Bent County. So here's the names of the farmers. The farmer might be, uh, let's see, one, two, and then where their address is. Wiley, Los Animas, Littleton. A lot, most of them from, so this is the area where McClave is. And then there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Bent, okay, no, sorry. Am I moving around too fast? Okay. So you got Ben Mayhew. This is phone number. Um, if you want me to call him, let me know. I'll find out, I'll ask and find out, or you guys can, all right? Use your academic freedom. <laughs> Not kidding. <laughs> Tell me you're a student at CSU Pueblo, and I'm in the class right now, History, Agriculture, and Labor. And when you say that, and you say you're like on week nine, and we're looking at hemp right now, the history of hemp. 
they're going to go into shock and they'd be very surprised and they'll probably be very amicable once you tell them that. Uh, I, that's happened to me. I identify myself as an adjunct instructor at CSU Pueblo and I'm getting ready for this class and I, that's happened over the last year. So you find out if you provide, where is your fields at? Where can you tell me where your fields are at or something? What, send me something like a map or something, where your fields are, how many acres, how many migrant workers there are, where are they living right now? Are they, you know, be nice about it. Don't, don't go into specifics of, well, I'm just calling because I'm trying to see if you're violating human rights. Don't do that. Don't, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't. <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead. No, no, nothing, nothing. I was just chuckling. Oh, okay, yeah. All right. Well, as you see now, so take the counties through the Arkansas Valley, okay? Uh, if somebody wants to do uh, uh, San Luis Valley counties, which is the watch, um, Los Animas County or something like that. But I more want to see, um, that's a good example, because I like to know where um, where those, they should be out there now. It, it's July, August, it's late within the ag, uh, hemp season. Okay, here's Prowers County where Lamar Grenada is, right over there in the southeastern corner. Remember, Baca County is the very corner. That's where the, hit, the Dust Bowl hit really hard, right? Um, mm -hmm. Really hard. Because um, right below that is the uh, Oklahoma border and Panhandle and Boise City in the Panhandle, Oklahoma, as you saw, got hit the most. Oh, uh, Boise City. Um, so that's the Dust Bowl epicenter. So you see how Here's Prowers, and let me see if I got any more. Um, so there you go, and see if what you can get, you know, in picture at all. So picture yourself. What's another county we could Otero, Manzanoa, for example. Ah. What is that? Is that a plane? I heard a weird sound. Okay, I think you guys are getting it. All right. Say, for example, what, what's really going to be easy is if you were to just look at um, what. Uh, if you really dug in hard and found, looked at what Ruben Donato was looking at for the period of time of the sugar beets uh, in 1920 and 1960, and you looked at the conditions of child education, compulsory education, public schools, the call out for them to not, well, working out in the fields was priority over actually work uh, being in school. And you would find that information out in an historical, you know, perspective be pretty easy. Here you're looking at something in the present. I guess the question is why are they track why are they tracking them who's growing what here? Why are they tracking who's growing hemp? We've talked about I've introduced purpose uh, what hemp was Tuesday. Why do you think they're kind of tracking this? The, uh, because it's because it's new and because it's something that's been banned for a long time and so uh exactly i yeah. think that uh, one of the things i have not talked about is the history of the criminalization of marijuana i should probably have done that um but we know that marijuana was illegal it still is kansas for example mm -hmm. okay so uh, we're at a point where i need you guys to look at questions that are set not the basic elements of the hemp analysis 
and ask yourselves questions. You need to start asking these questions. Like Justine, you did what you probably didn't realize that you were asking questions. What questions are we trying or trying to answer? And that's, you want to write it down because that's going how you build your main claim. All right, as you've been building from uh, your discussion responses and your midterm statement of need or protest, and you're developing to the point, your final product is that you know, a statement I need a protest finally. Okay, and now we're bringing it to the present. All right, the challenges are where, like I address, I can't even find out. The very fact that I can't find out, nobody's up front and telling me is a problem. All right, that's the problem. They should have told us, they should have been transparent is the word I should be look, telling you guys. Legally, legally, stuff that's on the books, we've already said legally on the federal level, they're supposed to be registered uh, for migrant and seasonal workers on the national level, Department of Labor. Okay, that's on their website. Uh, it's MSFW or something like that. Okay. Um, so ask the question. I tried to get to the point in more broad, not very broad terms, but um, here is by county who out there is, you see how they want to grow organic, all right, because there's no chemicals being used as opposed to before uh, for fertilizer or pesticides. And, but so when there's no herbicides, that means a lot of weeds grow. But who is, as you can see, very something similar to sugar beets, you gotta weed them before the harvest season. You want the separation between that particular plant or pro, uh, vegetable, whatever, for it to grow like sugar beets and the sugar content and towards the end of, by the harvest season, they grab their machete and chop off the stem from the top of it and set it back down so that way then all the sugar will what's be drawn to uh, the beet itself. Okay, that's the topping part. But here you, so I have given you guys a very, I gave you the events of what I heard from Kelly. That's an historical event, okay? <laughs> Not even a year. And that's what you guys gotta look at it as, an historical event as if we're looking back a hundred years to the sugar bean industry. All right, free yourself from, you know, as we'll hear from, you'll hear the journalist on the 23rd. And um, let's see what else. So I think I also had you guys look at how to decide that your statement of need or protest. Really, it was what is the condition, where are the aspects of social support services? Um, within the uh, need for migrant workers. And I'm trying to, let me see if I got another slide here. Let me see. So here it is. Um, really, I, I was hoping that uh, you guys at least dived in a little bit. Um, we also have the other one I've had since the beginning. The link to the other links. So here's some that's been up on since day one of this course. And I did tell you guys not to worry about it until now. So here's the time. <laughs> I, I did say in those terms, okay, now's the time to start. <laughs> uh, don't go in starting to worry. Before you go into these, maybe I should have said, so Justine, I'm glad you brought a good question. And Anna, you brought in a really profound statement. It really, whatever it is you've done already, with the discussion responses, with the midterm, okay, with the workshops and your writing. If you were to write a paragraph right now, which, well, well that's, this is, I'm gonna go ahead and do this is to, with what I've been saying or whatever it is you've been doing in the past, 
and up and through the discussion response number three. I want you guys to go ahead and bring up your whatever you got, um, Notepad, Microsoft Word. I want you to go ahead. We'll give take about dang uh, about ten minutes. All right, and write a paragraph, and we'll go over this paragraph, and then we'll develop uh, a couple of research questions or research problems, and those are just questions. All right, what are you trying to answer? We'll figure that out. But at least with what, like Justine, I try to answer your question in a very long-winded way. So just a paragraph, four or five lines. Okay, starting now, and then we'll go over them, please. So this paragraph's on anything, or? Uh, the, uh, what you know about hemp analysis and well, why we're doing it. Why are we doing hemp analysis and how it's connected to uh, looking at the conditions of migrant workers and uh, human rights? Which I might have to explain better. <laughs> Slides to put, okay. So I got the okay. This is a call card. I just want you to keep this what you put down. I guess this is where we're starting to develop what the hemp analysis will be and then to file or I'll be right back. I'm gonna go grab something real quick. Okay. This should only take a minute.
And are you working on anything? Yeah. Okay. I'll have the other people that are on today. I'll have them do this too. That's what I want. Exactly what I want. Let me see. Let's see. Let's see. Wait a couple more minutes and then I'll see about what person's got. And, um, oh, I was going to read this off as you guys take the next. Where is it? Okay, so, and I left my glasses up. What did I do? Okay, um, so really it's about where the not uh, industrial hemp as an agricultural product in the state of Colorado was first grown just three years ago due to cannabis late legalization. Agricultural hemp's most immediate social or cultural impact uh, has not been assessed, has not yet been assessed, or at least within Arkansas River Valley. The argument will be made via agronomy and labor data that, uh, that hemp presents new source of challenges, but accentuates decades worth of similar or comparative factors within labor and corporate intervention. So if I was to get onto a webinar uh, hosted by the Institute of Cannabis Research uh, next month uh, and present a paper about this, uh, and that's prob that would be it. It was supposed to be last April, uh, but of course they postponed it. Now it's just a webinar. Uh, talking about cannabis. Um, yeah, we're just presenting the paper. That's my proposal. Uh, this class is part of it. Um, I'm now just confessed. <laughs> so each and every, now of course I, who, if I, if I was to get anything, which, which I've already had, I should say that your contribution is already there uh, over the last few weeks. And if there's something that I include, then I would definitely cite uh, history class 490, uh, his, yeah, 491. And uh, so this part last couple of weeks in hemp analysis is your guys is guiding the rest of this course because this is a pilot program. And um, you guys are now part of that. You always have them, but now especially. And that's kind of why I was kind of being kind of strict on your, your writing to some extent, as much as I can, as humanely, <laughs> as humanely as I could. It's, it's <laughs> not, not as demeaning or insulting anybody, because uh, I know I, I, I've had to get away, get, break down my own biases as far as oh, everybody's all right you gotta get you need to be graduate level so this has been a challenge for me too oh actually especially the last few days uh and breaking down my own 
uh, irrational expectations within your writing. And so uh, I did, I've done some soul searching there. Okay, um, yeah, no, seriously, seriously. Um, I really have, I've had to go back and say, hey, wait a minute, give them a chance, uh, give you guys a chance. Uh, you have, I, I am looking at it, I know you have something, you are saying something and you are contributing. It's just, I have to, um, how, to what level do I have to be as far as not looking at within the rubric, okay? Uh, and this is actually the goal right here. And not, that's something why I told you guys to focus on what the syllabus says as to criteria, statement of need, statement of protest. You really are freeing yourself really and almost grammatically uh, within statement of protest. Um, I won't say go as far as writing an outright poem like many of Vila. I still need that evidence, that primary source that you guys have seen, as will be seen with the hemp and the, okay, uh, please, if you, if it's not too much and for the last few minutes, I'd like to hear from each of you, uh, read out loud, please, what you wrote, uh, please, if it's, if it's too much uh, for you, then just let me know, email to me, I'd really like to hear each one before we finish. Go ahead with Justine, are you okay going first? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Um, so I just put down, we're looking at hemp analysis because due to the impact it may have that is similar to the impact sugar beets had on migrant workers. We need to specifically look into working conditions, which includes child labor, housing, and childhood education when examining this. These are key problems that migrant workers faced in sugar beet colonies, and in order to see if there's an improvement on migrant working conditions, these factors from the past and present need to be compared to one another. If there has been a change in working conditions, then we can say that there are proper facilities put in place to monitor these issues. However, if there isn't, then there is a need for social programs and help for migrant workers to have their needs met and not face human rights abuses. Excellent. I want you to, with, that was really good. Um, uh, Aiden. Dang, I don't think I'm gonna top that. Uh, probably not. <laughs> Job, Justine. <laughs> well, no, we'll see. <laughs> oh, definitely not. So the half analysis <laughs> assignment is a quick, in-depth, concise historiographical look, court look at the last century's history of hemp, creating a statement of need slash pro protest involving human rights issues on migrant laborers, including but not limited to education, housing, water, and health. This entire project will be done on the confines of human rights, looking for the specific number of migrant workers and their impact on labor and agriculture. Okay, now, yeah, the next, Anna, if you could please, if you okay. don't mind. Uh, we look at, we look at hip, anal hip analysis because like the sugar beet industry before it, it seems to require a significant labor force to produce. The sugar beet industry was known to violate human rights in its labor practices, and hemp is a relative newcomer to the Arkansas River Valley, has potential as an agricultural product. Is there a way for hemp to be produced in such a way that labor is not exploited? What is the environmental impact of hemp? Really good. Derek, do you mind if I uh, go ahead and write, uh, read off yours, if you don't mind? Oh, he's mute. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I put uh, the hemp analysis is being done to compare and contrast the growth of marrow of hemp in Colorado compared to the growing of alfalfa and sugar beets in southeastern Colorado. We're going to use the information that we've already gained in the class to see if conditions for migrant workers have improved over time or if they are still the same. We're to look at the impact financially, safety concerns, educational and uh, medical opportunities for youth and migrant workers and to determine whether the hemp industry is pulling migrant workers in, uh, such as during the sugar beet uh, rush. Really good. Okay, I got. I want everybody to say that we're going to build on that. What you just put, uh, starting next week, uh, starting Tuesday. Keep it. Oh, I email. Please email it to me. I will. We are going. This is now your first building outline 
of your hemp analysis discussion response number four. All right. Whatever amount of pages you feel is appropriate, that is up to you. I, well, it was supposed to be one to two pages. Make it around three. One of, okay, two things. <laughs> um, yeah, I think this is a really good way to kind of get you guys. Every single one of you had direct voice. It had your own academic voice. Uh, nowhere did I hear it was it, that there. You probably you guys are kind of shocked. Yeah, that's that's where unless somebody can go back and look at their what they just read off or wrote and tell me I I, I didn't have my teacher ears on. I don't know. So we're gonna do that. So you keep it, and then we're gonna. So next week is not like regular lecture form. It's just going to be built upon workshops to the final product due by in next week. It was supposed to be on the 16th, right? Um, mm -hmm. Maybe I'll push it. I'll, I'll adjust a little bit towards the, end of the weekend. Not too far. I don't want you guys to languish into uh, where you're focused more on just the hemp analysis, but focusing more on the final. Um, so yeah, that's what we're going to do. You gonna keep that please, and then build your outline now, but build your questions from what you just wrote. Um, I can probably get better into that if you guys send in my email and I'll look at it. And by Tuesday, it will each and every one of us individually to develop your own, uh, uh, well, I guess, cl research question, research problem. This is going to build into your main claim. But at the same time, you're going to say within that, uh, here's my evidence. You're going to identify what your evidence is going to be. So it's going to be where by Tuesday, here's the, what I need you guys to do is to get, I'll be, look, you'll have a folder of all what it is we'll look at from the 60s on. That, but I've been holding back this whole entire time. So I'll look on Zotero, but I need one thing from coloradohistoricnewspapers.org. I need at least one article, okay, by Tuesday. All right, and we're gonna start building this outline. And also I'll have a folder already for Amache. Uh, videos I done up actually four months ago. I have one up there, you guys, some of you may have seen it. I'll just put more stuff. It'll be that a separate channel or list, playlist under the channel of YouTube. And it's about Amache itself and uh, the camp, okay? So one thing from historic newspapers, uh, historic newspapers, uh, look at Zotero. All the other stuff I've looked at will be up on there. Um, so yeah, I will leave it at that. So Tuesday, Thursday is workshopping. I might throw in one slide of, of uh, historical background, but I think that is it for me full-blown lecture or uh, uh, survey type thing. Uh, my, like, I didn't really mention about the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s and their attitudes towards, well, they wanted to include everything by the 1920s. Oh, everybody, now it was Mexican-Americans and migrant workers. At the time, it was Jews, African-Americans, and uh, Catholics. Oh, they, oh, oh, yeah, they just wanted everybody. They just want to hate everybody. Um, of course, now this, this, no, yeah, let's not even try to, you know, uh, we can talk all day about right now, but, uh, okay. Um, look at the links, go to some place where you can find on the library website about hemp. Uh, and I'll try to bring in the research center, Michelle Shui, uh, data analyst to help us out next week. And uh, 23rd, I think I've gone over time. Yeah, by three minutes. So keep that, please email it to me. I will make sure the others do the same uh, or at least get them to do the same thing on Tuesday. Uh, and I want also a group effort. I might have this all online. You, you guys will be talking with each other. I'll be just sitting here waiting for anybody to ask questions. So literally, you guys are developing the next two to three weeks curriculum. I, this is, I know it's a surprise to me, but 
No, and it wasn't. Okay, I think I've gone over time. Any questions? How long is the hemp analysis uh, paper? Yeah, I kind of left that out in the open, didn't I? Okay, at least minimum of two pages. Don't, hey, I think I want to talk about, I don't want to talk about it, state one thing. You guys can put in a chart or diagram or picture. Okay, that they allow that. <laughs> they allow that. I don't know why. I'm surprised nobody has done that yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, that's up to you. Don't put, don't make the whole, okay, pages. Uh, hemp analysis, another page or two. Okay, that's it. Uh, I don't need, uh, this is just to build a, hey, this is my prospectus coming up to my protest or need statement. So three to four, that's it. I, I don't want you guys, don't go beyond, take one. If, if you can't get beyond where migrant work, get as far as you can. That's your paper, get as far as you can trying to find out where their migrant workers are now if you can't get any farther than that and see where, how they're living and one of the aspects of education or housing standards, that's fine. We'll get as far as you can. The goal is to get as far as you can with finding out a farmers and where these migrant workers are in this field so have hemp or whatever, whatever he's growing, onions maybe, or cantaloupe. Find everything out you, as much as you can. And if you want to send me something they have maybe on a file, then send it to me. You can draw it up on your map of the county or the fields, whatever. Google Earth, Google Maps. I don't care. That'd be, that'd be fantastic. That'd be great. I, okay. I think that's it. This is now hereby deemed student-led. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Bye. Anna, you're you're like, are your laptops way up here? <laughs> well, up in my mic. Normally, I normally I'm I have it set up like this, but I'm sitting on my couch because it's cooler downstairs. <laughs> it is. I'm downstairs now. Nice yeah. and cool down here. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta go. I gotta get back to work. But hi, stop. <laughs> Bye.